Thank you so much, bro. Okay, all right. Any other questions? So otherwise we'll move on to the next chapter actually, which is called the Aila Gita. Now, in, in uh, Shivad Bhagavatam, we lead number of different types of Geets. Can anybody tell me any of the famous Geets in Shivad Bhagavatam? Gopi Geet. Yes, Mother, thank you. That's one. What else? Um, and then... Brahmar Geet, yes. Brahmar Geet. And then the El Geet now coming up. I'm sorry? El Geet. I, I can't hear you. I like it. I like it. Yes, that's that's the one we're going to talk about now. Anything else? Did anyone say Uddhav Git? Uddhav is Brahma Git. No, 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 no. Oh, that is different. Brahma Git is Radharani. Radharani. And you may oh. recall a few weeks ago we talked about Bhikshu Git. It was Bhikshu Git. Yes, yeah, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so now we're going to talk about Ayla Geet. And basically it's about the, uh, um, how do I say it? It's, it's, it's about how unfavorable association becomes a threat to one's position in devotional service. And like, uh, Contrary to that, how by associating with devotees, one can attain the highest platform of devotion. So um, I'll explain this in a minute, uh, in more, uh, more detail. But basically unfavorable association, not good for our devotion service. Favorable association, good for our association, uh, our devotion. Hmm. So let's say, a person who's fully dedicated to the Lord. In other words, a pure devotee is liberated from the influence of Maya. And you may recall, and I always get mixed up, I think it was uh, Srila Yamuna Acharya, I could be wrong on this one. Uh, he said, when I look at Krishna, I see Maya standing far behind with the hands folded. And he also said, Mukti is standing there also with hands folded. Basically meaning that a devotee is above Maya and above desire <coughs> for Mukti. And this can happen to a devotee even when the devotee is still in the current body living in the material world. On the other hand, non-devotees who are completely in the Maya, they're devoted not to the Lord, but only to their belly and their genitals. Therefore, they're impure and if we associate with those people, we'll fall down from our devotional service for sure. Maybe even to the degree of falling in the, what's called the dark pit of ignorance. And so the Ayla Gita is sung by a very famous uh, emperor. His name was Pururava. You may recall his, his uh, pastime when uh, Urvashi came and he wanted to marry her and she put a condition that he should never see her naked, otherwise she would leave. And he accepted that condition and married her. But then Indra started missing her in the, in the heavenly planets. So he made a plan where some of his servants came and uh, pretended to cause some disturbance when he was still in bed with her. So he went out without any clothes on to see what's going on. And they became very effulgent. So there was a lot of light in the room. And therefore, uh, Urvashi and Pururava saw each other uh, naked. And therefore, she said, as per the condition, I'm leaving. And she left. And that made Pururava sad in the beginning. But then he became very disgusted. He became very, very disgusted with his uh, uh, previous tendency to associate with women. And... Uh, he sang a song that's now known as Ayla Gita. The song basically um, talks about how uh, contemptuous it is to have a connection with women. Um, he said, uh, those people who are attached to the body, 
to their body, whether it's a own body or man body. Um, a body is simply a, how do you say, a, a bunch of, or a mass of uh, skin, meat, um, flesh, I should say, uh, blood, you know, bone marrows, you know, bones, etc. And in that sense, the body is not much different from a worm. And he says, or the song says, that what is the worth of education, austerity, renunciation, um, even studies of the Vedas, um, I think I already said that. As uh, living in the forest all by yourself uh, or taking a vow of silence, you know, what's the use of all that if the mind becomes stolen by the body of a woman or a man? Song goes on further to say, learned men should distrust the six mental enemies. Does anybody know what six mental enemies are? It was referred to just a few minutes ago. Prabhuji, desire, anger, greed. Yeah, the six anarthas. Uh, yes. Yeah, six yes. anarthas. Ignorance. Right. Not ignorance. So it's not, not, uh, delusion. Illusion, yes. Illusion. Yes, so lust, greed, anger, illusion. Um, so let's create anger, illusion. Um, Jealousy. Madness and envy. Envy, jealous. Okay. So those are six uh, basically... Enemies of our mind. And so we should, the learned among us, should distrust these six enemies and avoid the association with women or with men, depending upon what body they are, or with men who are controlled by women. So actually, there is a very nice verse in the fifth canto. Um, I think it's fifth canto, fifth chapter, second verse. It says, Mahat Sevam Ahur Dwaram Vimukte Tamas Dwaram Yoshit Sangi Sang Sangha. Basically, it says that those of us who serve the pure devotees, the doors of liberation are open to us. But those among us who associate with men who associate with women, they open the doors of hell for themselves. In Chaitanya Chaitanya, also the same thing is said by Lord Chaitanya. He says, Asat Sangi Tyaga, Ehi Vaishnava Chare. Istri Sangi Ek Asadhu, Krishna Bhakta Ara. He says, we must give up the uh, association of Asat people. Asat be those who are not pure, those who are not devotees, who are very much into Maya and women and all those kind of things. Uh, a Vaishnava must give up that association. And he says, the next line says, those who are associating with women or women associated with men, they are asadhu, not devotees. They are definitely not Krishna bhaktas. So therefore, their association should be avoided. So this is what King Puru Rava sang in his uh, Ayla Geet. And, and, and he became uh, free from the um, effect of Maya and therefore, uh, material existence. He realized Supreme Lord as, uh, as the super soul and he went home back, back to God. So basically the conclusion of the Ayla Geet is that one who's intelligent should, no, must give up the association of, of materialistic people, especially those who are too attached to uh, persons of opposite gender and become attracted to the company of devotees. You may recall in the of devotion, it says, Ado Shraddha Tato Sadhu Sangh at Bhajana Kriya. So Sadhu Sangh becomes very important in all situations. So same thing is being said here. And he says, the pure devotees can give us instructions, transcendental instructions, that will allow us to break all the material attachments. Uh, the real, sorry, the, the pure devotees are always liberated. 
because they are just attached to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And in their association, what is the one activity that happens? Anybody wants to tell me? What's the one activity that happens when we are in the association of devotees, not just pure devotees, devotees? Discussing about the Lord? Exactly. Exactly. Machitta madgat prana bodhyantas parasparam kathyantascha mamnitya tushyanticha ramanticha. Chapter 10, text 8. So that's what devotees do. So that's what we will do if we have association of the devotees. Uh, so this constant discussion of the Supreme Lord. And by thus serving the Lord, we are able to eradicate all our material sins and obtain the platform of pure devotional service, which is the highest platform, the highest gain. It's basically what uh, Lord Brahma said in uh, Brahma Samhita, uh, text 54. Let me see if I can remember it. Just in the Gopam Aho Atva. No, just in the Gopam Atva. Just in the Gopam Atva Indra. Sukarma Aho Sukarma. Karma. Anyway, the next line is Karmani Nidahati Kintucha Bhakti Bhaja. The pure devotional service destroys all our sinful reactions. And that's what this beat is saying. That we associate with the devotees and in their association constantly discuss <laughs> and glorify the Lord, all our sinful reactions will be uh, removed and we will reach the platform of pure devotional service. So I'm going to pause again, see if there are any questions or comments. Sorry, I got mixed up with that particular verse. I say it every day, but right now I forgot. Anyway. Anyone? Okay, then I'll keep going. So now, Uddhav says, Lord Krishna, I want to understand what is the prescribed method of worshipping your deity for? Also, please tell me what is the qualification or what are the qualifications of a pujari? What's the basis on which your worship of the deity form is established? And what is the specific method of worship? So he said, the method of worshipping the qualification of pujari and what is the basis on which the worship or the method of worship is established. So, Lord Krishna says something that we must all understand very well. Why we do deity worship? He said, deity worship automatically brings purity and satisfaction to the mind. So, deity worship is done for purification and satisfaction of our mind. And he said, very interesting. He said, a person who has no engagement in deity service will simply remain attracted to material sense gratification. And therefore, he'll have no hope of giving up, giving up bad association. And as we were talking about before, ultimately the bad association it results in falling down in the dark pit of ignorance. Okay. And then he said, there are three varieties of deity worship. First one is based on Vedas. Second is based on Tantras like Panch Panchuratra or Gautamiya Tantra. A third is based on the combination of the Vedas and the Tantras. So does anybody know what method we use in this con? Panchuratrika. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, exactly. And there's a famous orange book that uh, explains all this, uh, how to do it. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So a person who has gotten his second initiation or her second initiation should worship the Lord without duplicity, offering appropriate paraphernalia, but should all be done in a mood of love. It's no use offering bhoga or doing arti when uh, there's no love in the heart. Uh, and I know that many of us suffer from that. So basically we are practicing to develop that love, but ultimately we need to get there. Now, the deity form itself, anybody knows uh, what can make a deity? What substance? 
Panchadatu and eight datus. Are you talking about the yes, eight? Yes, I'm talking about that. So tell me about the eight Ashtadhatu, not Ashtadhatu itself, but eight different things that a deity can be made of. Silver. Okay. Wood. Uh, wood. Wood. Wood, yeah. Brass. Clay. So actually, basically any metal, which is silver, brass, yeah. etc. So wood, mm -hmm. metal, what else? Stone. Stone, yes, absolutely, yes. Clay. Clay, Clay. yes, Clay. yes. Sand. Like a paint, yes. Prabhu, even sand. sand. Even sand, yes. Sand. My also, mind also. Mind also, yes. So one more left. Paper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, paper, I think, is basically paint, a uh, picture. A yeah, jewel. Part of picture. Actually, yeah. Any jewel can also be. Picture. Mm. Photo. Yeah. Gold. 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 Okay, we got the eight. So we said stone. We said wood, which is silver, brass, metal, which is three. Clay is four. Paint, picture, paper, whatever is five. Sand is six. Mind and jewel yeah. or jewelry. That's eight. Now, can anyone guess of all these eight, which one is the highest? The answer may surprise you. Go ahead. Mind. Yes, actually. Mind, Thank you. mind Thank you. is the highest. Absolutely. That's the highest. And we have so many stories of devotees serving in the mind and having amazing pastimes. Yes. Okay. So then Lord says, okay, fine. Now I'm going to describe to you the details of the worshipping process itself. So, I mean, as you can guess, he said, the first thing the devotee should do is bathe. Physically and mentally. How do you mentally bathe anybody? How do you... Achman, Achman and... So there's a little bit more than that. You're on the right track, Prabhu. But you don't just do Achman, you do something when you do Achman. Mantras. So the process to, to uh, purify in, inside is the mantras. Uh, there's a very wonderful, uh, and I forget which Upanishad is from, he says, Om Apavitra Pavitra Va Sarvatha Avasthasu Gatopi Va Yas Madet Pradi Kaksha Sabbahi Abhi Antara Shuchi. So inside, outside, but chanting the mantra of Adhokshita, which is Lord Krishna, or remembering Lord Krishna. So Gayatri Mantra, etc., these mantras are there for our internal purification. Soap and water for external, mantras for internal. So he said, we should do that, a devotee should do that before starting the process of um, of duty worship, duty worship. And he said, Gayatri must be done three times a day. What are the three times, anybody? What are the three specified times? Can you all hear me now? Yes, Prabhuji. Okay, so how much were you able to hear? I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> what was the last thing you heard? Yes, some red pundri captions. Okay, all right. Yes. Thank you, Prabhu. So basically, I was saying that to clean ourselves outside is the soap and water. Clean ourselves inside is the mantras. And then I was saying Gayatri uh, is one of the most famous and common purification mantra. And we're supposed to be chanted three times of the day. And then I asked the question, what are the three times of the day we're supposed to be chanted? Anyone? Morning, noon, and evening, Prabhuji. Yes, Prabhuji. Thank you. And does anybody know where you're supposed to face? Uh, yes, Prabhuji. To the Lord. In the morning, to the east. East. And in the noon, to the north. And in the evening, to the west, Prabhuji. Yes, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. And we can also... What, uh, what I read, Prabhuji, may be right or not, I don't know, correct me if I'm right, Prabhuji. Uh, it also, I have heard, we can face the deities, doesn't matter what direction they are. Correct. Prabhuji. That is correct, Prabhu. So those are, the, those are the options. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then the first thing that should be done is... Uh, um, uh, this must be a seat 
for for the for the pujari even if he's standing there should be a seat so we're not supposed to stand on bare floor there must be a mat or seat some kind of seat or you either sit down or stand so that's another very important aspect of deity worship he said um and then we should bathe and clean the deity um i'm sorry i forgot one thing um after after taking the bath or bathing i should say or showering whatever a devotee should also mark no not should must also mark his body the 12 parts of the body by chanting different mantras this tilak like, uh, marking ceremony right om keshavaya namaha om narayana namaha om madhavaya namaha etc etc so we should we must do that before we enter the deity room um we should similarly sanctify um and this is more for the temple worship the different parts of the deity also and then we should clean the uh deity so any flowers remaining there when other things that area whole area should be cleaned there should be no old flowers left or trees <coughs> of office left or anything like that and then we should prepare the the sacred pot for sprinkling uh the deities um and then we should present the clothes ornaments etc and uh, and uh half of colon please okay and uh, uh we should offer the uh, abhishek ceremony basically for the deity where wherever possible and then we should offer you know um the part of the what do you call it the aarti and then we should offer fragrant oils incense lamps flowers etc and of course bhoga should be done before the aarti uh recommended and appropriate mantra should be chanted during this time um and i'm not talking about aarti like gor aarti vidhi so for example when bathing the deity we should be chanting um brahma samhita that's one recommended form there may be others uh but that's one that uh, is quite common in iskon and then of course always uh, offer obeisances men you know prostrate women panchanga i should always ask for some benediction not material benediction and always beg for forgiveness um for any mistakes committed and then partake on any remnants uh with these flowers the garlands or bhoga itself like uh, food sanctified food now um if we do that in a uh, unconditional mood in that that we're not asking for anything material then we will eventually get to the stage of love of the lord uh and then krishna very interesting uh krishna finished by saying if one steals property that is given as charity to the deity or to the brahmanas even if the brahmanas the pujari himself or by others that person the thief will have to take his next birth as a stool eating worm i thought it was very interesting that he said that especially because we just found out that uh, uh where was it in montreal one of the temples or maybe it was brampton one of the temples yesterday somebody stole the whole donation box from the temple and walked away with it so anyway so he's saying krishna is saying you steal you take next birth as tool work anyway so i'll pause again see there any questions or comments what do you what what about um, when we sponsor the fish they are in the temple and then we also take part uh, eat the prasadam from there what about it that that is not like a stealing or anything once we that is also like a giving to the to the temple then eating it back there again from the yeah you basically honoring prasadam that's good thing oh, okay right? that's a good thing okay Yeah. Thank you, Prabhu. Sure. Uttam Prabhu? Uh, Prabhu Ji, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Just about the Gayatri Mantra, so Prabhu Ji, I am not initiate. Can I change a Gayatri Mantra? Because somebody said 
because it's for after second initiation. So okay. I'm not fastly initiated also. Is it like because from childhood we listen to Gayatri? So we just keep singing. So is it good to sing or we should not sing it? Yeah. So Prabhu, there are two varieties of Gayatri Mantra. One is that a lot of people chat even though they're not initiated. Mm -hmm. Other is the Gayatri Mantra that is given through a guru. And it's supposed to be confidential actually. Mm -hmm. So you're not supposed to chant that unless you are second initiated. Okay. And this one, strictly speaking, the answer is no. Okay. But I know that there's so many people who do this. Yeah. So what can I say? So like uh, for me, so what will be your recommendation? Just because from the so many, it's just it's like uh, we keep singing sometimes. So I should stop. Uh, in this age, all you need to chant is Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Yeah. So I do, Prabhuji. I do. Then, so then, I then it's fine. Then you don't need to chant anything else. Okay. So I should stop here. And Prabhuji, one more question. Like for the deity worship, like I have the deity, but it was not, what is that? Uh, like I just bought it and kept it. It's not like, what is call it? Uh, like um, uh, Pran protest. I didn't do any Pran protest. Is it okay to do that? Or we should do fast pran pratisha being some devotee or do something in your like house yeah in your house you should not do pran pratisha okay because pran pratisha means now it's installed deity and you have to be second initiated to worship it mm -hmm. not only that the rules must be followed extremely strictly just like temple standard okay you can't miss an arti you cannot miss a bhog okay, okay, must be it. right on time now all those kind of things daily bathing you know, at minimum three times oh. offering a bhoga mm -hmm. and arti. So mm -hmm. many rules come in. Okay. So you, you should not do it. Now, uh, uh, some level of property is done automatically as soon as you start worshipping a deity. As a matter of fact, a statue becomes a deity mm -hmm. when you start worshipping it. Mm -hmm. So if you buy, for example, Krishna Murti yeah. in a store, it's just a Murti a statue. Yeah. yeah. But the moment you put it on an altar, you start worshipping it, it becomes a deity. Mm -hmm. Okay. But still that pran pratishta. Okay. Just like it. So you have the flexibility of being a householder mm -hmm. and therefore the rules are not as strict. Okay. So Prabhuji, your recommendation like whatever I bought, whatever I am doing presently, I'm worshipping in my asana. So that's fine. You mean I should go that way. Continue okay. with that. Don't consider them installed deities. Don't no, worship yeah. Shaligram Shila. No, I don't. Yeah, I'm just saying. I'm yeah, just... Okay. You know, chant Hare Krishna Muhammad, there's okay. nothing higher than that. Okay. So it's fine. I can worship because some people say when you keep deity, you should do all these so many things. Like no, no, no. Home deities are very lenient. Okay. So it's fine to do. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank sure. You. Thank you. Anand Vilas Prabhu? Um, Prabhu, I heard, I heard or I have seen also like you the pujari when they go down on altar, they should have unstitched clothing. That is that a like uh, some recommended procedure or is it? Yes, Prabhu. That's that's part of Pachita yeah, Because yeah, everything is thread in a way. That is correct. Now, but they are thread is, also. I'm sorry, Prabhu. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Because everything is a thread. Correct. Correct. Everything is thread, but right, still, so let me check. Oh. there's a distinction made between stitched and non-stitched clothing. And uh, Matajis have an exception allowed because they have to wear a blouse, which is stitched. But men uh, don't need to. Okay. Okay. Krishna uh, Prabhu? what is the, you mentioned that we yeah. should always have a seat. What is the significance, whether you're standing or sitting? So basically, um, it says that your feet should not touch the ground directly. And there should be some cushion between them. So a seat is important. It's considered a, a uh, uh, more purified because you can put water and all that on that. And therefore, you should stand on that. I don't know if that's a satisfactory explanation, but that's all I know. But I do know that you must stand or sit on a seat. Like Chodis Chatai, basically. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'll move on. 
Now Krishna says, let me tell you about Jnana Yoga. And he's going to talk about Jnana Yoga, then he's going to talk about Bhakti Yoga also. He said, understand something. Like sometimes people don't understand this very simple point. He said, the world basically has two things. The material world has only two things. The souls which are, who are trying to enjoy and the material nature, which is what they are trying to enjoy. So basically, material world is a combination of material nature and the transcendental souls who are trying to enjoy the material nature. That's, that's it. And he said, every created thing in the material world is a material product of three modes of nature. And it's not real, or at least not permanent. It's not real in that sense. And the duality or designation of you know, good and bad that we assign basically to various objects, which is totally subjective because what's good for me may be bad for you and vice versa also. And he said, the whole assignment of good and bad is totally superficial, meaning it's relative. It is, he said, it's better to avoid condemning or praising anything or anyone in the material world because that act of condemning or praising will entangle us in the matter and it will make it more difficult to achieve the higher goal of spiritual life. Okay, so this whole thing about this is bad, that's good, um, uh, he's bad, he's good, not good. And uh, Lord Chaitanya said the same thing in Bengali, he said, basically he said, this is bad, this is good, that's all bogus, don't do that. And he said, we end up doing that because we identify with the body. And as soon as we do that, we, we come in the, what the technical is known as false bodily consciousness. And those of us who lack the discrimination between the spirit and matter, which is soul and the body, they continue to remain entangled in the cycle of repeated birth and death. Because being in the bodily consciousness, they absorb in sense gratification. Their sense gratification, not Krishna's sense gratification. So they have to go through the different phases of material life, like birth, death, sorrow, happiness, etc., because they remain on the bodily platform. Because understand, birth, death, does it belong to the soul? Yes, no? No, Prabhu. No, Prabhu. Yes. No, Prabhu. No, Prabhu. No, Prabhu. Birth doesn't belong no, to the soul. Birth doesn't belong. Yeah. So the soul. Birth and death are related to body only. Right, right. But the soul itself, is it dying? Ever? No, no Prabhu. No, no, take, no Prabhu. Did it take birth at any time? No. No, no, no Prabhu. Ajay Nitya Shastra Ayam Purano. Nah, nete hane mane suriye. Right, Krishna made it very clear. It doesn't take birth, it doesn't die. So birth and death don't belong to soul. What about sorrow and happiness? Does it belong to the soul? No, soul, mm -hmm. doesn't, soul doesn't get happy, doesn't get uh, sorrow, material sense, material sense. So therefore, all this is because of bodily consciousness. Yes. Another word for that is false ego. Okay? The soul is identifying with the body. So if the soul did not identify with the body, in other words, there's no false ego, There'll be no sorrow, there will be no happiness, there will be no duality of the material world. So therefore, if we learn to distinguish between the soul and the body, we'll have no false ego. And therefore, we'll have no false identification of, the, of that we are this body, not the soul. Okay, now, the absolute truth. How many absolute truths are there? Anybody? One, Mataji says one, so I'll agree with that. There's only one single absolute truth. And when is it present? 
Is it present before material world is created? Always present. Right? Always yes, present. Always. So before, during, and after. Oh, right? Yes. Yeah, it's always there. So uh, that's why it's absolute truth. During is doing the maintenance and the cosmic manifestation um, is basically resting on what's known as Brahman effulgence. Brahman effulgence itself is the, basically the rays of the body of the Lord and therefore self-sufficient. But the material world depends upon the the Brahman effulges for its existence because that's where it's resting. No Brahman effulges, material world has no place to stay. Okay? So that's, that's one point. Um, <clears throat> material world is mostly um, produced through mode of passion. That's why Brahma is in, the, in charge of mode of passion. Right. So how do you understand the absolute truth? either by the mercy of a bona fide spiritual master who can explain the scriptures, which are the other source. Obviously, it's only one source of scriptures, but to the via, via medium spiritual master, we can understand the shastras or the scriptures. And that's when we can understand that the body is not spiritual, we are spiritual. And, uh, and that we, the soul, is like the sun, that remains untouched by the coming and going of the clouds. Right? Sun is not affected by the clouds. Are they in the sky or not? <coughs> Similarly, a person who's liberated, in other words, on the spiritual platform, is not affected by the activities of the senses. However, that doesn't mean one should start uh, getting involved with material things. Try to avoid as much as possible, but generally speaking, a person on the platform of pure devotional service is not affected by material sense objects. Right? But the caution should be there, so avoid it. But if you are aspiring devotees, then we have all sorts of obstacles and we may actually fall down. But the good thing is that when an aspiring devotee falls down before he achieves perfection or she achieves perfection, then the next birth, what does Krishna say? You start from the point you left off. So the devotion service is never destroyed. Um, what does Krishna say in chapter 2? I think it's text 42, isn't it? Neha vikram nashosti prithivayo na vidyate sulpam api asa dharma se trayate mahitavayat. Wherever you leave off, that's where you start. Okay, so, so that, that's, that's a good news, right? Then he says, a pure devotee is liberated and is able to fully discriminate between soul and the body. That person never seeks material enjoyment, never indulges in material gratification. Because he knows that the soul can come under illusion by getting involved, or sorry, by being covered by Maya when he becomes involved with sense gratification uh, or material, or it comes in touch with material sense objects. Therefore, he stays away from them. So again, that same thing is repeated by Krishna in uh, chapter 5, text 22. How does it go? Yehi sans prasujab hoga, dukh yoniya evte, adi antavanta konte, natte shuramute buddha. The buddha, the, the uh, intelligent, the pure devotees, they never get involved in material sensory perceptions because they know it's useless, it's nothing but illusion. It'll, it'll affect their devotional service negatively. Then he says, we, the aspiring devotees, are still in the diseased condition. And just like we need medicine for physical diseases, we need a, a medicine for being 
are in somewhat material consciousness. And therefore, we should take proper measures to find the remedies. So for example, you know, the anarthas we were talking about, what is the remedy for getting rid of anarthas? Anyone? What's Chanty. the remedy? Mahamantra. Yes. Mahamantra. yes. So basically devotional service and begging for the mercy of the Lord. So in the age of Kali, Sankirtan Yajna is the recommended process for getting rid of anarthas. And Sankirtan, as we know, must be done loudly. Does anybody know why it must be done loudly? So that others can be benefited. Exactly. Thank you, Prabhu. And then similarly, what's the remedy for false ego? Surrender to Guru, Prabhu? Yes, that's part of it. There's a little bit more than that. Same lines. Think serving. Serving Krishna and, and? and the devotees. Yes. So, yes. So, the best Vaishnavas. remedy for getting rid of false ego is serving Vaishnavas uh, and Lord Krishna. Okay? So, Krishna is giving the remedy. He says, you know, some non devotees may keep the body fit, may look young and all that, by they may even. Uh, uh, achieve some mystic perfection, you know, the Siddhis by doing some yoga. But all these things are useless. They're worthless because they only belong to the body, which is temporary. So you work all that hard work and you lose the body. So what's the good? So therefore, an intelligent person is not interested in any of this. He simply takes shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord and his devotees. And thus, he's able to get rid of all disturbances, all uh, obstacles, and becomes empowered to attain the highest perfection, which is the full bliss of spiritual life or devotional life. So I'm going to pause again and see if there are any questions, comments. Was it clear? If not, please ask questions so I can clarify them. Um, Hare Krishna Prabhu. I just remember something when you said looking for good and bad in this world is like uh, there's a saying in Bengali, I forgot what it was that I Mandabha. Think, like, Mandabha. making a distinction between a dry dry yeah, dry stool and wet stool. Like that's the distinction you are the making. Stool. Yeah, that's right. Which one is good? Like which yeah, one exactly. is bad. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Thank so you. In in Bengali there is something but I, I'm forgetting it actually. So, for good and bad, yeah, the word is yeah, mand yes. and bhal. Or yeah, mand and bhal. If you are, if you are right. Bengali accents, mando and bhalo. Bhalo and mando. Bhalo, yeah. yeah. <laughs> are you Bengali? Bengali? Yeah. Okay, yeah, then yeah, you, you can say it better than I can. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can speak Bengali, but it's only Hindi accent. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> so, then after Gyan Yoga, Krishna says, okay, I have to leave out Bhakti Yoga also. Um, and he said, I'm going to tell you because actually, you know, you know, I think Uddhav said, my dear Lord, this Yadav is very difficult because you're talking about detachment and renunciation and all those kind of things. You know, is there something easier? He said, of course, I'm glad you asked. And he said, let's talk about devotional service. Um, uh, chapter 9, text 2, how does it go? Raj Vidya, Raj Guhiyam, Pavitra Midam Uttamam. Uh, dharmam, susukham kartam so, susukham, have fun while you're doing devotional service. What can be easier than that? The easiest and the most direct process is devotional service. So he said, the other thing is the karmis and the yogis, they can become bewildered by maya. And then they become puffed up by their, you know, I got this siddhi, I got that siddhi, I got this and that. And they don't take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. The so karmis and yogis find very difficult to take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. But those men who are able to distinguish, and he describes that these men are like swan. What's the quality of the swan? You give them a mixture of water and milk, 
the swan will take the milk, leave the water behind. So that's the dis discrimination, the ability to discriminate by the swans. So he said, swan like men who know how to distinguish between what's essential and what's not essential, they take shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord. And to them, the Lord helps in two ways. One is from within as Paramatma or Chakti Guru. And other is from outside or without is as the bona fide spiritual master who's able to teach by example. And these two gurus, Chakti Guru and external guru, they are able to eradicate all the misfortune of the soul and, and Krishna will then reveal to them his personal form. Remember Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita again, Bhaktiya Maam Abhijanati. The only way to know me is to perform devotional service. And the reason you know me through devotional service is because then I reveal myself to the degree, or I should say, proportional to or proportionate to the purity of a devotional service. So therefore, we should execute all our duties simply for the sake of the Lord keeping our mind absorbed on him 24-7. We should take advantage of the, uh, the holy lands where Krishna did his pastimes, like Mathura, Dwarka, Vrindavan, Mayapur, etc., where the devote, his devotees reside. We should serve the Lord <laughs> there, and of course everywhere, uh, and celebrate all the festivals and holidays in his honor, whether it's Janmashtami or uh, Gaur Purnima, Balam Jayanti, or whatever. Perform all that. That's all part of Bhakti Yoga. And we should consider that the Lord is residing in the heart of every living entity, not just humans, every living entity in the form of super soul. And therefore, we should honor and offer obeisances actually to every living entity because we are honoring and offering obeisances not to the living entity, but to the super soul residing in the heart of that living entity. And when we do that, all the anarthas, including envy, as well as false ego, will be removed. And if we can bear this in mind, we will find it easily, or sorry, easier to give up um, non-devotee relatives, proud relatives, and give up our separatist outlook. I like that word, separatist outlook. What does separatist do? He says, you are different from me, I'm separate from you, therefore you're bad, I'm good. Now, all that goes away. And, and then Krishna says, as long as one has not learned to see the presence of Paramatma in all creatures, He, he, he must continue to use his mind, his body, and his speech to worship the Lord and offer you know, full obeisances and absorb the body, the mind, and the speech to the service of the Lord. Now, this process, Krishna is explaining, but he's the one who established it. So therefore, anything that Krishna establishes is true, not just today, not just yesterday, but it'll be always true. It's eternally true. You can go back a million years, you can come, go forward a trillion years, it'll still be true. And therefore, uh, nothing Nothing can ever beat it or nothing can ever prove devotional service to be fruitless because it has been established by the Lord. And when one offers himself completely to the Lord with exclusive devotion, ananya bhakti, then Lord becomes very pleased and the devotee will be given uh, uh, a place in the abode of the Lord, depending upon the mood of the devotee, even obtain 
uh, opulence equal to the, the, that of the Lord, which is like starshti, mukti, and certainly immortality. So that's how he explained devotional service to Uddha. At this point, Uddha uh, begged for permission to go to Bhadrakashram to pursue Krishna's orders and instructions. And uh, at the end of it, he went to the Lord's abode. Remember, the Lord was leaving uh, the material world. Uddha was there and he said, please take me with you. And Krishna said, no, I need you to do some things. And so this was part of it, that you go instruct other people, preach and all that. So you go to Bhadrakashram to do all that. Okay, any questions? Questions, comments? Is it still Krishna, Krishna, Guruji? Yeah. Yes, you, you said about the super soul and Chitta Guru. Is it a spiritual Chatya master? Guru. Chatya Guru. Guru. Is it the spiritual master you are referring or just super soul is the same? Chatya Guru. Sorry, let me say it again. The super soul acts as Chatya Guru, which is Guru from within. Okay. By giving us inspirations, instructions, etc. Okay. And then you have the outside Guru, the bona fide spiritual master. Okay. In the discipline succession. Mm -hmm. So you have two gurus that way. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Okay, all right. So I'll keep going. So now Krishna. Actually, let me go back a little. <coughs> so Parishit Maharaj says to Shukdev Goswami. So now Uddhav is gone. So what did Lord Krishna do in Dwarka after Uddhav left? And then he said, I, you know, I know that Krishna gave up his body. So how did he do that? How did he give up his body? And how this dynasty got destroyed, destructed completely because of that curse of the Brahmanas that we talked about you know, many weeks ago. So Shukdev Goswami said that after Uddhav went or left for Bhattakasham, Lord Krishna noticed all sorts of bad omens. And so he advised um, all the residents of <coughs> excuse me, all the residents of Dwarka to leave. He advised the women, children, and old men to go to a village called Shankodhara, I think. Shankodhar. And all the able-bodied, strong, young Yadavas to go to a place called Prabhaschitra, which is in Gujarat, just like Dwarka is, on the bank of the river Saraswati. And so you should go there to, and perform various rituals, including five sacrifices, to counteract the bad fortune that's heading towards us. So everybody followed Krishna's advice. The men went to Prabhashit. There with you know, great degree of devotion. They performed all sorts of religious ceremonies and auspicious rituals, you know, just as Krishna has instructed them to do. Then Krishna did something wonderful. With this illusory potency, he covered the intelligence, the, all the, the whole clan, hundreds of thousands of them, covered the intelligence, and they got, uh, how do I say, it? they started drinking liquor and became totally drunk out of their minds, totally intoxicated, and bewildered by Krishna's Maya, they started fight among each other. And they, this was serious fight, like the bows and arrows, swords, clubs, spears, and they were using all this to attack each other, right there by the shore of the ocean. And some were riding on the elephants, some were riding the chariots, and some were actually, it says in Bhagavatam, they were riding on donkeys, camels, bulls, buffaloes, mules, and some were even riding other human beings on top of the shoulders of other human beings. But they were all very angry. And they came there and started violently attacking each other. Bhagavatam says, just like two elephants fight with their tusks. So these, these men were fighting with each other in that mood. And, and then there was a very interesting uh, statement in Bhagavatam. It says, their mutual enmity aroused, which we never heard before, never heard before, that somehow it was there just was not manifested because of the presence of Krishna at that time. So here now, Pradyumna is fighting against Samba, his cousin. Akura is fighting against Kuntibhuj. 
and the Rudras fighting against Satyaki, and so on and so forth. Like these people, they were so blinded by the intoxication of the liquor, and they were completely bewildered by the Lord, of course, that the sons were fighting their fathers, brothers were fighting their brothers, nephews with paternal and maternal uncles, grandsons were fighting their grandfathers, I mean, friends fighting with friends, well wishes fighting with well wishes. Unbelievable. Intimate friends, relatives, they're fighting and killing each other. Can you please keep yourself on mute? Let me just do it again. Thank you. So finally, when all their bows had been broken, their arrows and missiles were finished, they seized that tall stalks of cane that had been growing on the seashore with their bare hands. Now, does anybody know how these canes came to be growing there? Anyone? That probably just smashed the rock which has been smashed and uh, thrown in the ocean so it came out in the shore and... Correct, correct. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, so Ugrasen had asked the, the walk to be drowned to powder and the powder sprayed um, in the ocean. So that that powder turned into this case which became thunderbolt once these guys picked them up. Now they're fighting with basically iron rods, not sugar cane rods, um, which was hard as thunderbolts and killing each other with that. You know, Lord Krishna and Lord Balram actually tried to stop them from doing this and they started to attack Lord Krishna and Lord Balram. They were taking, so they were seeing Lord Balram, Lord Krishna as their own enemy. And with weapons in hand, they ran towards them. And they actually intended to kill them. So at this point, Krishna and Balram got very angry. And they picked up their own cane stocks and started killing all those who were running to attack them. Anyway, so this was basically all because of the Brahmana's curse. And of course, bewilderment by Krishna's Maya. And every one of them died in that battle. Um, once they were all destroyed, dead, I mean, Krishna was really satisfied. He said, now the last burden of the earth has been removed because his biggest worry was that these warriors, the Yadus are so powerful, they'll become bad influence and they'll become bad guys. It's so a good guys if they still remain. So therefore, he caused this whole pastime. Lord Balram sat down on the shore of the ocean and fixed himself in the meditation upon himself and merged himself with himself and went back to his supreme abode. Lord Krishna saw the departure of Lord Balram. He sat down silently on the ground under a nearby tree and he put his right foot on the left, which was bent. So if you can visualize that his right foot is on, right leg I should say, is on the knee of the left foot. And a hunter named Jara saw this and he mistook the soul of the Lord as a, as a foot of a deer and he shot the arrow, pierced it, but they realized his mistake. He came running, fell flat at the feet of the Lord and he said, please punish me, I've made this such a blunder. And Lord Krishna said, no, no. It was all my plan. Don't worry about it. And actually he sent the hunter to Vaikuntha. And then Daruka, Krishna's charioteer came and he saw Lord in that condition. And he was, you know, upset. He was lamenting. And Krishna told him, don't, don't worry about it. Go to Dwarka. Tell all the residents there uh, who was left there basically that uh, the whole Yudhi dynasty is finished, annihilated, and advise them all to leave Dwarka for Indraprastha under the protection of Arjun. And he said, they have to do this quickly because very soon the whole city of Dwarka will be submerged under the ocean water. So Daruk went to Dwarka, told everyone um, what's going on. In the meantime, Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva and many other demigods they realized that Lord Krishna is about to wrap up his pastimes in the material world. So they all crowded the skies to see the scene. Of course, most of the demigods and sages were not able to see 
as Krishna entered his own abode, but Brahma and Shiva did. And uh, they were amazed, like how Krishna can do these things. So I'm going to pause again for a quick few seconds, see if there are any questions or comments before I do the last chapter of Bhagavad Gita, sorry, of Canto 11 of Bhagavatam. And then from next week, we'll move to Canto 12. Any questions or comments? Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna uh, Just have, there is a, like, there is a one grandson who was not killed because he yes. built so the we'll, temple. Yeah. Yes, so we'll talk about it, that. Vajranava was his name. Vajranava, yeah. Yes, so we'll talk about him in a minute. Okay, thank you. And Prabhuji, uh, what about the, all the wives? So they survive and they are... Yeah, so we'll talk about that out, you know? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just, just give me a minute. Yeah, sure. Anything else? Okay, all right. So quickly. So uh, Daruk, as I said, went to Dwarka and he told everybody what had happened. And of course, you can imagine how, how sad and distraught all these people would be. They felt you know, extreme pain of separation from Krishna and other relatives. And they were you know, beating their face and their chest and all that. And they came running to Prabhasya to where they expected to find all the bodies, dead bodies. When Devaki, Rohini, and Vasudev could not find their sons Krishna and Balaram, they lost consciousness and out of anguish and out of, the, out of the torment of separation by Krishna and Balaram, they gave up their body right on the spot. The wives of the Yadavas, they climbed onto the funeral pyres, embracing their dead husbands and gave up their body in the fire. The wives of Lord Balaram also entered the fire. And here's the interesting part. Bhagavatam says they embraced his body. Vasudev's wives entered the fire, embraced Vasudev's body. The daughters-in-law of the Lord Krishna, like the wives of his sons, they entered the funeral fire with their husbands. <coughs> and Rukmini and other wives of Lord Krishna, they entered the fire that was built for him. Now, we know that Lord Krishna did not leave body behind. He doesn't have a material body. He returned to his eternal abode in his own body, which is spiritual. So Bhagavatam says that it was the Lord's Maya that made uh, the wives of Krishna and Balram think that they are seeing the body of Krishna and Balram and they entered with that body in the fire. So majority of them did. But many were did not, were not able to. They are the ones, as Uttam Prabhu was asking, they were taken to Indraprasth along with Arjun, and there there was a big battle with some ab aborigines uh, and Arjun. And that same Arjun who won the battle of Kurukshetra, you know, was not able to defeat them, and they actually took away many of these wives. Anyway, so so that that was that. Um, all the demigods who had taken birth upon the instructions of Krishna in the Yadu dynasty, they went back to their own planets. Arjun was, you know, as you can imagine, very depressed, uh, very distressed uh, upon separation from Krishna. He didn't know what to do, but then he started to mem remember the instructions Krishna gave in Bhagavad Gita, and they, that gave him solace. Arjun then made sure that all the funeral rites were carried out properly, all the puja was done, etc., etc., and uh, and uh, he took care of all these things for every one of the yadus uh, who left the body there. Um, and as Krishna has predicted, as soon as Krishna uh, left material world and all these funeral rites etc., were done, the whole city of Dwaraka, except for the palace of Krishna submerged on the water of ocean and that's why we don't see the real Dwarka anymore it's under the water however the uh, archaeologists have found many artifacts on the ocean bed from the time of Krishna's residence in Dwarka thus endeth the 11th canto of Shimad Bhagavatam uh, I'll wait for some questions and then I have a few more comments to make Okay, so it looks like very clear. Nobody has any. Yes, Prabhu. Yes, Prabhu, go ahead. 
Yeah, I was wondering these uh, Yadus, they they were extremely powerful. Sorry, they were demigods and uh, Sorry, bro, associates you were, of Lord. You were breaking up, I couldn't hear. Okay. Is it okay now? Can you hear yeah, me? Yes, yes. Uh, those Yadus are like extremely powerful people, right? Mm -hmm. Yadus. Mm -hmm. Because they were demigods and associate of the Lord, so any no one else could finish them, right? That's the one. Correct. Reason that, and that's the come. reason. That's the reason Krishna arranged this pastime. Okay. Yeah. And still, these people. Some people say we are Yadavas in India. Still, that we are sure. the Prabhu, you can same call, family or something. You can call yourself anything you want. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. So the only person yeah, that was asking, claim that, yeah. yeah, as you were asked, Uttar Prabhu was asking before, the only person that was left was uh, Vajranap, the great grandson of Lord Krishna. And he was installed by, uh, actually, no, I lied. There were two people left. Um, one is <clears throat> Vajranap, who was installed as the uh, king of Mathura. Jamil. By, huh? Sorry? Uddhav, another one? And the other one Uddhav was Parikshit. Parikshit. Oh, Parikshit. Yes. yes. Uddhav, Uddhav also, Prabhuji? Yes, Uddhav also, yes. I'm sorry. I, but Uddhav was, it was a cousin. Of, so I was talking about the descendants of Krishna. Oh, okay. So Uddhav was not a descendant. He's a cousin. Okay. All right. So... <clears throat> As I was saying, uh, we have finished the 11th canto, so there's one more canto to go. So we'll start from next week. Um, if any one of you is here whose email address I don't have, which you would know if you're not getting my emails, that means I don't have your email address. So um, on the chat, I'm going to put my email address. Please note it down and send me your email. An email which basically lets me know what your email address is, and I'll add you to the distribution list. Okay, so feel free to send me an email. Just say, you know, Hare Krishna, and then I'll know your email address, and I'll put that in the distribution list. Okay. It's 9.35, so we are five minutes over our time. Any questions or comments before we finish? Oh, I have a question. I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. So you mentioned that only uh, three people were uh, were alive after Krishna wrapped up his pastime. So, so what happened to those uh, whom he sent to Indra first? No, so remember, these were old men and women that was sent. So this among the descendants, there was nobody left. Except oh, okay. These two. Oh, okay. Some women were left. Some uh, older men were left. Like so they Uttara, were just... Uttara was still there. Uttara was left. But she's not a descendant. Oh, okay. Like different family. Oh, okay. Actually, Parishit Maharaj, same thing. Different family. So really, there's only one. Bajanav. All right, then doesn't sound like any other questions. So thank, thank you, Mother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, thank you, Hare Krishna. Thank you Mother. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Good to see you, Namnit. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you again.